Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live, and tonight it is my special honor to have with us Kerr Smith from such movies as Final Destination, My Bloody Valentine, TV shows as Dawson's Creek, Charmed, and uh, your resume, Kerr, goes on and on. Very impressive. Thank you for being here with us. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, it is our honor, and we have a lot to talk about, so let's just get started. Uh, let's start with Dawson's Creek, okay? Uh, a hugely popular show. This was an era where 20 and 30 year olds were being cast to play teenagers. Uh, why was that really done? And obviously, it's changed a lot to how it's being done today. But what are your thoughts on that back then, having people in their late 20s, even early 30s, portraying teenagers? Well, I think typically that's that's pretty much how it's been done. I mean, if you look at 90210 or any of those other shows like like Dawson's Creek, I mean, everybody was pretty much, you know, a solid five years older than they were playing. Um, so, yeah, I was definitely I think I was about six or seven years older than than uh, the other four. So I had a, a, a few years on them. But, you know, to answer your question on. You know the dialogue and why they why they talk that way, like they were a thirty year old. It's it's. I think it's because I, I talked to Kevin Williamson about this once, and he said it was like each character was speaking from their soul. Yeah. And each character is a part of Kevin Williamson's personality, and he wanted them to be that mature, you know, knowing a lot more than than the physical being. So you know, I think that you're just talking from your heart and talking from your soul, and it just. It just worked. It, it could have failed, but it, it really worked. It, people uh, people loved it. It really did. And not only for Dawson's Creek, but for a lot of other uh, shows. Do you see the trend has changed here now in the year 2021 where roles, I mean, they're not exactly like you take a 19-year-old to play a 15-year-old. That's perfectly fine and normal. But do you think it's changed a little bit here in the year 2021? Changed as far as casting, the roles of the cast? Casting actors that are closer to the character age that they're playing. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, because, you know, now I'm I'm your age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? So it's like everybody's young to me now. So I, I don't know how to answer that. Okay. They might be casting a little bit, you know, skewing a little bit younger these days. But um, in my experience back then, it was it, – we pretty much – Aside from Michelle Williams, she was actually playing her age. Uh, everybody else was a little bit older. Okay. okay. I mean, that, like I said, it was the normal thing to do. And it still is being done quite a bit today. Now, let's move on. Uh, I'm sure you've been killed to death with this question. But you have the distinct honor of being the first television character to do an on-screen kiss with some, with another man. Uh, mm -hmm. uh and people were like, wow, this is not like 60, 70 years ago. This was, you know, in the early 2000s. And we have come a long, long way since then. How does it feel? And do people come up to you? And how do they re react to you for you being a part of that moment in TV history? Well, these days, it's uh, it's pretty amazing because obviously the world is, you know, has definitely changed uh, in this instance for the better. And uh, I think people are accepting, you know, other other people for who they are. And we certainly played a part of that uh, back uh, when we did this storyline. Um, you know, back then it was um, scary for me because a lot of people were writing me back then. It was all, you know, letters and everything. There was I don't think there was any email at that point. Uh, and, you know, I was getting emails that just basically scared the hell out of me. And I realized how much of a responsibility that the role that I was playing was. I mean, I remember specifically one letter from a, um, a young boy. He said, hey, I watched the, you know, I, I watched the episode when you came out to your father. And it's and uh, it motivated me to right then and there turn off the television set, walked into his parents room and and, and he told wow. told him the truth. Yeah, and that's that's pretty heavy because you know I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm just an actor, man. I just take words off the page and make it as real as I possibly can. So it was then that I, like I said, I really um, I started to realize how much of a responsibility it is. But nowadays, mm -hmm. it's great 
because I get I get stuff on Instagram all the time saying thank you so much. I was going through the same thing as your character was back then, and it's just great that everybody's happy and, and you know it's accepted now. So I think all of us are really proud to be uh, to have a part to play in that whole scenario back then. Oops, absolutely, and I find it a lot that actors who portray characters that do uh, what is or was considered taboo. Uh, you know, really get embraced, and they it really has an impact on society. Uh, not just for you, but every actor, uh, the character that they portray on screen, uh, it has an impact. It makes an impact to people who are watching it. And just hats off to you. I mean, you know, here we are in the year 2021, and it's become acceptable, more than acceptable. It's become common, normal. And it's opened everything up. So, again, hats off to you uh, for doing a great job and bearing that responsibility. Now, you have a directing credit uh, for Dawson's Creek. Uh, Is that something you would like to do again? Would you like to go more into directing? Yeah, you know, that was the first gig that I did. It was in season six. I think it was episode 609. Uh, It was quite an experience. I mean, I I really enjoyed it. it is not something that I pursued since. I enjoy acting uh, more than directing. Um, you know, directing's a big, it's a big task. Yeah. I mean, you got you have you're juggling a lot of balls. I mean, it's it's but it's fun, and I learned a lot. And and, and coming from the acting side, uh, really helped me. You know, when I did that episode, um, I've thought about it over the years, but I just haven't pulled the trigger on it again. I might, I might maybe when I get a little bit older. Okay. Okay. Now, looking back on your years as Jack McPhee, McPhee sorry, uh, you know where was where it's revealed that your character is is uh, gay. How do you feel that changed the landscape of television? Do you think Dawson's Creek in that moment and in your character being part of the LGBT community uh, coming out changed television moving forward? Absolutely. I mean, if you look at television today. There is a, uh, a gay character or lesbian character or whatever on just about every television mm-hmm. show, and it's completely acceptable. In fact, it's, don't even, you don't even think about it anymore. So, yeah, it's changed the landscape of television, not only television, but I think society. Absolutely. I definitely agree with you. Now, you have a great career. You've been on some of the biggest uh, TV shows. You've done uh, awesome movies. Uh, where does Dawson's Creek uh, sit in your heart? in uh in regard to all the other projects that you have done well it was obviously really uh really special for me it was the first really big job a role that i had played i was 20 i'm gonna say 27 years old playing 16 <laughs> <It's quite laughs> spread. um and the, you know the unique thing about it was that you know we shot the show in wilmington north carolina and i had just i was in new york i'm a east coaster and I just moved to Los Angeles uh, to, to further my career. I felt New York, I kind of tapped it out and did the soaps and the and indies and the commercials and all that. And I was, just said, all right, I'm gonna go to LA. Within seven weeks, I, this is this is a cool story, guys. Yeah. All right, so on the drive out, I'm driving in the Penske truck with my girlfriend at the time, and we're driving out to Venice, California. And I, I was saying to her, I said, there's two jobs that I would love to have. Like, I'm nobody. I'm just like, but there are two two shows on television right now I'd really like to do. One was Party Five, and one was this brand new show called Dawson's Creek. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but Dawson's was a midseason uh, replacement for, on the um, WB at the time, yeah. which is now the CW. So they only did really 13 episodes that first season, full season for network television's roughly 23 episodes. Mm-hmm. So... You know, Joey had climbed in the window up the ladder and all that. And I had only watched the pilot. And I said, I said to my girlfriend, I was like, this thing's going to be a huge hit. So those are the two shows that I wanted to get on. Well, would you believe it? But I, the first audition I had was for Party of Five. I blew it. <laughs> blew it. Didn't get that. I don't remember what the role was. And then a couple weeks later, I had just a general meeting with Kathleen uh, Lettery, who was the uh, head casting director for Warner Brothers at the time. And we just sat down in our office. I didn't read for anything. I was just talking about the where I was going to live and the car I was going to you know, try and get and everything. 
And by the end of the conversation, she goes, Kerr, I'm putting you on one of our shows. I don't know what it's going to be yet, but I'm, I'm going to do it. So I went through the whole process. I thought for a while it was going to be Jack and Jill. You mm-hmm. remember that show? I do. Um, and Dawson's, these two roles, Jack and Andy McPhee came up um, to add on to Dawson's Creek in season two. And I went through the whole process of testing and all that. And son of a gun, if I didn't get it. Wow. So now I'm in, I'm in L.A. for two months. And now I'm moving to Wilmington, North Carolina for the next five years. Wow. So to answer your question, yes, it was really, really special to me. And one of the big things was that it, was, it wasn't it was in Hollywood. No. We felt like we were at camp. You know what I mean? Yeah. We, didn't, we didn't even realize it was a hit until hundreds of people started showing up on the exterior sets. It was just crazy. It just out of nowhere. It was, it, was, it was really cool. I remember the time. I remember how huge Dawson's Creek was. Now, before you did Dawson's Creek... I believe I have my timeline correct. You start in Final Destination. Uh, no, Final Destination I did on my first hiatus. So it was it was during the summer uh, after my first season of Dawson's. Okay, okay. Now, yeah. uh, so let me rephrase the question I was going to ask. Do you think your time on Dawson's Creek led to you getting the, one of the lead roles in Final Destination? Well, it always plays a part. I mean, if you've got some success attached to your name, even if it's just for, you know, a year, then yeah, I mean, it definitely helps. But I, I remember that audition. It was on the Fox lot and it was with John Papsidera, who was the casting director. And I think, uh, one of the producers might've been in the room. I can't remember. Um, anyway, I remember the audition vividly and I walked out of there and I thought to myself, I think I might get this. I mean, I just gelled with these guys. I, the, we talked about the character and, and what I wanted to do with it. I was very um, insistent with my uh, reps saying, look, you know, I'm playing Jack McPhee now. It, it's a very risky role. I want to do the exact opposite character. Because you don't want to be pigeonholed. Yeah. And of course, Carter Horton is the exact opposite. He's a meathead. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was it was it was cool, and I remember actually walking out with another actor that he just auditioned too, and he he said, "What do you do?" And I said, "Well, I just started the show Dawson's Creek," and he goes, "Oh man, you're getting this part." <laughs> he was, I didn't think he was right, but he was right. Uh, so you do Final Destination, and it's a hit, you know. Now you have like Dawson's Creek. Uh, you said you filmed uh, Final Destination during a hiatus. You have a, a TV show hit. You have a uh, the first movie of what is going to become a franchise. It's wildly successful. Um, now, going deeper into Final Destination, breaking down some of the scenes, one of the most intense scenes is that car when you're on the train tracks. Uh, walk us through that scene. What was it like doing that scene in Final Destination? Yeah, we were up in Squamish, uh up north of Vancouver, which is on the way up to Whistler in uh, Blackcomb and in this little town. And I think we spent a week up there and uh, it was all nights and it was pretty intense. I think this is when I realized, wow, this is a pretty big movie. Mm-hmm. could be. Excuse me. So these train tracks run through Squamish. And I was talking to, I think it was Glenn, about you know what they had, um, one of the producers, about what they had you know planned for us. And he said, well, they scheduled two trains to come through and they had two, they actually had three of my muscle car. One was a stunt car. One was a regular one. And one was just a shell that they had kind of pre-cut in almost in half. Mm -hmm. So what we had, what we did was we put, we put the car that was almost cut in half on the tracks. This is really cool how they did this. And then we had to schedule, we only had one shot at this. We had to schedule this first train to come by and just rip this car right in half on the tracks. And I think this is actually the same time when we were on the other side of the tracks and the, the thing slices Sean yeah. William Scott's, you know, oh, you're next, you're next. And he's freaking out. And I pee my pants and all that good stuff. That's another good story. <laughs> and uh, so that was one time it goes by the train, uh, the train comes by. And on the other time, uh, there was no car, but they had um, everybody that was in the car, myself, Devin, um, uh, Sean, I think that was it. Maybe there's one other, I can't remember. Was Allie in the car? I don't remember. I think she was. She I was. could be wrong. So too, anyway, yeah. they constructed this whole box to the side of the railroad tracks and the, and we crouched in it 
and they built all this weird series of mirrors so that it looked like we were on the track somehow, but we weren't. We were off the track as this second train blew through. I got to be honest with you, it was, we again, we had, it was a lot of pressure. We had one chance to get this right, and we were awfully close to that to that train that blew by. And I don't know if you've ever stood next to a train that's gone, you know, 40, 50 miles an hour, but it's a lot of wind. I mean, it'll just suck you right in. So that it was, it was crazy. That That's really interesting because it leads me to my next question. Final Destination seemed like it was a very physically intense movie to act in. Uh, and the next question was, did you ever feel like you were in danger, like the whole train thing? Was there any other moments like that where you felt, whoa, we're pushing the boundaries of safety here? No, I, you know, the production companies are very good about that. Even back then, um, safety is always going to come first. So, you know, they did everything they can could to keep it as safe as possible and, and still, you know, get them get the uh, the film in the can. So, you know, today it's even more. I mean, it's crazy safe now. Oh, yeah. It's, there's been a lot of things that have changed in the film business. I mean, going back to the days of Final Destination, I mean, what, like the story you just told about the train, it really leads you to appreciate practical effects as opposed to the CGI that we have today. Today, if Final Destination was filmed today, it, I mean, I guarantee you, I don't know, if, you know, I'm not a filmmaker, I'm not an expert, but they would have done a lot more, you know, computer generated stuff instead of the way it they was, actually did it it was too expensive back then i mean you did what you had to uh there are a couple other things i can remember in final destination where we did the physical um like when when uh, amanda gets hit by the bus mm -hmm. there's no cgi there that was a series of three different shots just like we did with the with the train except three this time yeah. one with amanda standing there and no bus one with a bus that just goes by and one with the bus that goes by and hits uh, a dummy Amanda with all the blood. Yeah. And then they splice that perfectly together. So it looks like, you know, she gets taken out. It was perfect. Um, another, another example I can think of is, and that was one of the most iconic moments in, in, you know, kind of thriller mm -hmm. movie history. It was so shocking when that happened. When the first time I saw it, I saw it about 15 minutes after they did it. They literally put it together in the film trail trailer and he was like come here, come here come here i checked it out and it was just i was like oh my god that's incredible we just did that the other cool thing we did on that set which involved no cgi was the plane crash itself mm -hmm. in in the tube that we had a piece of a fuselage in a studio that was on a giant gimbal and we had a stunt guy go on here you know, or a special effects guy with a little joystick and he just had full control of that thing and it was just rocking us all over the place it actually broke we had to fix it and took held us up a day. But again, just you know, to what you were saying, not much CGI. No, 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 not not back in those days. Uh, and that makes you appreciate the film and what went into making it even more, in my opinion. Uh, so putting yourself in like, let's say you were Alex's friend, would you have believed him if he came to you, if you were to put yourself in that was a real life situation? when he came to you with the premonition? No, I wouldn't have. Yeah, it just, it seems th so yeah. far out there. I mean, uh, you know, it's it's just way too weird. When do you think Carter finally switched his perspective and starts to see Alex uh, as a friend and ultimately saving his life? That's a good question, and you're really... Uh... You're really testing me here. <laughs> this was 20 years ago now. Uh, yeah. um, let's see. Uh, not, no, not the funeral, not yet. Um, it is a hard one. I, I think probably when other uh, friends started getting killed. Yeah. You know, like Todd... Um, Danella, I forget it, or um, Chad Danella. What was his character name? Was Todd? When he gets picked off in the in the um, bathroom. Yes. That, I think what, probably right around there, after a few people got killed, I'm like, hmm, okay, uh, maybe this kid is right. Yeah, I mean, it's a matter of perspective. For me, I would lean more towards that train scene uh, as maybe being the time. But 
you know, oh, yeah. yeah, it could be anything. It, it's very, uh, you know, it's subjective. It's up to uh, the viewer's interpretation. Uh, and I love that about it. Now, when you did Final Destination, the film was a unique addition to the horror genre. Uh, how was the film described to you and what attracted you to the role in the script? Um, the film was originally called Flight 180, and they changed the name during production to the most perfect name uh, you could ever come up with, Final Destination. Um, Flight 180 was a little weak. Uh, they, they sold me on the fact, what I loved about it was that it was not, the killer was not somebody tangible. Exactly. It wasn't somebody running around in a mask. It was, it was, it was your own fears and, it, and you could construct whatever it was that scared you the most that was coming after you. That's what I loved because that can appeal to anyone. That's a very good point. You know? Yeah. How do you uh, have you watched the subsequent movies? And if you did, how do you feel them linking Final Destination Five back to the first movie? If you've watched, I them? haven't seen. Yeah, I haven't seen Five. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't. It, what happened? Did they just walk through the the airport right when it happens? Yeah. Is what the scene is? Yeah. Yeah, I heard that. Um. I I don't know. I think it's kind of cool. Actually, it is. It is. It's it's. I like how they tie it all together. How was it like working with Tony Todd? It was. I didn't have any scenes with him, um, but I met him a couple times on set. Nice guy, really cool. He's got the coolest voice I've ever heard in my life. That's Candyman right there. Uh, also, yeah. uh, James Wong. What was your experience working with James Wong on Final Destination? He was great. He was, you know, he was in full control of what he wanted to do. And, you know, we'd sit down and he was, he'd tell me things that they were doing that I wouldn't even have known about. Another cool thing he, he showed me was when we were at the airport, this is in the first couple of days of shooting, the, uh, the, the, the catwalk that gets down to the, the jetway, mm -hmm. it gets down to the airport. He walked me down that and he said, do you see anything weird? And I said, it looks a little off. And he goes, walk with me. Now, I'm six feet tall. So the ceiling's about, I don't know, a foot over my head, like a normal jet, maybe two feet mm -hmm. over my head. And as we walked down towards the end, I had to crouch because the ceiling was skewed. Ooh. So the visual, yeah, nobody, the vision, we did all this through all the movie. So no, it just makes it everything a little teeny off. Like in the, in the, uh, when Chad Danella, when he gets killed in the bathroom, the tiles, take a look at that. They're not actually they're, they're skewed a little bit they're not squares it's just teeny little things it was then that i knew that we were making a really smart movie that is so cool i did not know that it's i have it, yeah. it, it's not something that you just would pick up on as a regular viewer watching the film now the characters in final destination they're trying to cheat death uh they're on the run trying to cheat death and realistically if this were to happen in real life uh you know, uh, it's hard to say that somebody would be accepting of their fate as it was told to them. Do you agree with that? Or let's say you put yourself in that uh, situation. Someone tells you your future. Would you try to do exactly as the characters did and uh, change what is called the inevitable? Or would you be accepting of it? Putting yourself into you the character's shoes. Are you asking me as as Carter at that age? Or are you asking me as Kerr at forty nine? Kerr at forty nine. Most of my life, I've always I've never liked the idea of of uh, not being in control of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I see things a little bit differently. I th I think that there are some things that are fate and some things that are not. I think the decisions that we make on a daily basis every second of our lives, it's ours. Yeah. But I think there are certain catalytic events that go through our lives, that are peppered through our lives, that uh, we kind of um, predetermined ourselves mm -hmm. for us to have certain experiences in this life. So if it's a plane crash in Carter's uh, situation and he somehow cheats that catalytic fate that's supposed to happen it will happen again and again and again until it plays out the way that it's supposed to and carter or kerr 
or anybody or business learns the lesson that they're supposed to learn with that that event. So that's a, yes and no. That's a very interesting insight into it. Uh, and I love that insight into it. Uh, now, was there anything that happened on the set uh, that was kind of freaky, freaked you guys out? Any, you know, mishaps or anything like that? Um, no, I can't think of anything weird or supernatural, if that's what you're no, asking. The no, only no. thing that was we- the only thing that was kind of crazy is when the gimbal broke, when we were all sitting in that plane, and the, whole, the thing just kind of tilted back at a really severe angle and we're all like uh how, how do we get how do we get out of this <laughs> now do you think the whole overarching storyline like what you just described the fate trying to escape fate you think that's what attributed uh a huge part to the success of final destination and made it so appealing to fans the say that the first part again the just it. the uh you know this person having a premonition finding out your future uh it's a very intriguing concept to fans yeah uh do you think that's a huge part into what made this a successful franchise i do i think i think the bringing up the question of of fate in everybody's lives is is a huge you know attraction and i think the other attraction from the movie is that death itself is not it's not physical so, like I said before, it can be anything that you are completely terrified of. Okay, that's fair enough. Uh, let's move on now to My Bloody Valentine, okay? Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, the remake as well as the original. Uh, before I ask you the question, we, we before you did the film, had you watched the original? Yes, yeah. And what did you think of the original? I did. It was, it was, you know, it was your typical, it was good. It was very cheesy. A lot of Velveet on that movie. Exactly. Um, we made a very different movie, even in terms of the, the story, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, I did watch it just to make sure, you know, I, I knew where we were coming from here. So uh, having seen the movie, reading the script before you guys started shooting, uh, did you like the different, you know, some of the different angles they took in the reboot? Yeah, I, you know, my biggest thing was that for Axel the, the Palmer, the character that I played, I wanted to make sure that he he was he was being considered as the bad guy. Mm-hmm. Some people that watch that movie go, "Man, I thought it was you," and some people go, "No, no, it wasn't you." So it's it's interesting to get the feedback on on how everybody perceived it. Okay. So that was a big. Now. Uh... You know, for those of you that are not familiar with My Bloody Valentine, it's about a coal mining town. A lot of the movies shot in coal mines. Uh, was it actually shot in real coal mines or was that a soundstage? No, we actually shot outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in a real uh, coal. I don't know if it was coal, but it was a real mine. It, I believe it was still active. It was in a little town. No, wait, we sh- the town was called Harmony. That's where we shot. But I think the mine was a little bit farther outside. But it was active, uh, not on the level that we did it. We did it on the – we didn't go down into the ground. We did it on the surface level into the mountain. Yes. And, and I think the active mine was, was way down deep. So, but i got to be honest, it was really, really interesting shooting in a mine like that. It was really cool. It sounds cool. A- uh, I mean – where are you are you the claustrophobic kind did it freak you out no no but you have to be really careful you know there's a lot of stuff that you can you can hurt yourself on and you know jensen and i did that huge fight scene uh deep in the that was actually in the mine and uh you know we we banged ourselves up pretty pretty well um i hit my head on the on the rafters a couple of times one actually even made the cut we played it off like it you know like it meant we meant to happen um What's else? The other cool thing is that it's it's a constant fifty five degrees in there, so it's like super. It's perfect all the time. It's it's just a really. How do I explain it? I mean, I don't know if you've ever taken a tour of a mine or anything mm-hmm. or, or a cave, but it's just a it's a very interesting feeling. I would I would think Spooky. it's very eerie and I don't right. know. 
It just, yeah. I, yeah, I would think it's just very, I've never been in one. I'd like to go in one one day, and hopefully I will. Now, My Bloody Valentine 3D, did you have any degree of reluctance to take something like that movie on, or was it purely a way of escaping into a, a complete fantasy world? Uh, are you talking about the 3D aspect? Yes. No, I was very eager to take that on because, believe it or not, that was the first 3D movie that was being made. The only other 3D movie that had been made was was an animated movie. I think it was Beowulf. Okay. So, yeah, so I was literally watching a new technology unfold every day right in front of my face. It was really cool to watch because I, I have a huge interest in cinematography and, and directing, as you, as you said. So... It was neat, you know. We took it was it was kind of cool because they were figuring out as we went. And what they did was they had normally you just have one camera, right? But with this, we had we're using red cameras, which are really good cameras, and we had one that went right at the right at the subject, and then we had another one at ninety degrees that shot down into a forty five degree mirror that was slightly offset. So we had two cameras that were almost the same picture and obviously one's for for each eye and that's how they achieve the 3d effect wow that's pretty yeah that's and pretty we had just we had just moved to digital too in the business you know everything was on a, a sd card now it used to be you know film and huge rolls of it you know yeah, how it works 35 and, millimeter, uh, yeah. yeah so we had all these extra guys that uh, were on the in these new positions of being responsible for all this digital information and i'm like this is the coolest thing ever I'm literally watching this business being being reinvented. So it wasn't even just about the 3D for me. It was about the digital aspect as well. The technology. It's cool. Now, I believe the number is at least 90% of all motion picture, whether it's film or TV, it's all digital. There is some, oh, yeah. there is some uh, uh, stuff that's still being done uh, with film, but it's all, it's all digital now. Now, Jamie King, who was our guest several days ago, was the main uh, female lead in My Bloody Valentine. Uh, what was your experience working with Jamie? Oh, Jamie's great. We had a blast. Super nice girl. Um, yeah, it was... Uh, I'm trying to think of anything, like, really funny that happened or, you know, stories like um, Final Destination, but I can't think of too many. Uh, as far as an actress, uh, I've had her on my show twice now, she seems like she really immerses herself into the character. Uh, at least that's how she is now. Is that how she took on uh, her role in My Bloody Valentine? I, I re yeah, I remember her um, being pretty intense about what she was doing, and she really, she really worked hard, uh, and I think she did a fantastic job. Um, yeah, she was really fun to work with. She really was. Yeah, she's she's a great person. Now let's move on because, like I said, you have a huge resume. Uh, Riverdale. You were in season four of R Riverdale. A lot happened. What was it like joining the cast at that point of the show? That was. Lo I love Riverdale, and I, I hope that they have me back. I would I would love to continue. Uh, exploring uh, Holden Honey because I think there's a lot more to explore with that with that character. I'm, I was having a really good time. Uh, I ain't dead yet. Looks like I am, but I ain't dead yet. <laughs> um, it was a weird experience for me, and here's why. It parallels Dawson's Creek. I mean, the, the, the tone of the show is completely different. Mm -hmm. But the four kids in high school, they're all friends. The colors are the same, the, the blue and the gold as, as uh, Cape Cod High and Riverdale High. Everything was so similar. The only difference was that I wasn't one of the high school kids. Mm -hmm. I was the damn principal, which freaked me out because I was – I remember a specific day on uh, in Dawson's Creek, and we had we had several principals of Ababa Tunde, and then we had Harry Shearer come in for a little while, and I remember Harry Shearer's – first day on set as, as the principal. And I did this scene with him and, and I was afterwards, I was thinking, I was thinking, man, he's like so much older than me. I, it's like, I wonder how he feels working around all these kids. Well, now I know I'm Harry Shearer. This is crazy. Yeah. So it was really, 
it was cool in a sense because the four of them really, I think we, we all got along really well and they accepted me as, uh, as one of their own and which made it really nice for me. But at, at the same, you know, on the other side of the token, it's, uh, I was the, I was the adult. Yeah. Yeah. That, so it was, that, it was, that moment in your life where you get that age check reality check that I'm not, a, I can't play a high schooler yeah. anymore. You know, I didn't have a problem a problem playing an adult on any other show or any other show. but for this this particular job because it was just so close to home for me it was very very strange and do you attribute that directly to it brought you back to your dawson's creek days yeah it did i mean it just i felt weird i felt like i was one of the kids running around that you know goofing off and you know, doing crazy scenes with uh, Josh Jackson. It just felt like the same, same kind of thing to me. And I, I, I just, I kind of embraced that and, and tried to do that, you know, as holding honey too. <laughs> <laughs> now, were you familiar? That's, 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 that's make, the, make, the, make the cut, but it's pretty funny. <laughs> were you familiar with the prior, you know, were you familiar with Riverdale before you came on in season four, any of the prior seasons uh, of the show? I was familiar with it. I hadn't hadn't watched uh, too much of it before I got the job. Then I watched a, a bunch of it uh, as much as I could anyway because it was, wasn't a lot of time. But, yeah, I was very familiar with it. I mean, Greg Berlanti, you know, he's Dawson. Greg Berlanti is the executive producer, one of the executive producers of, uh, of Riverdale, and he was also uh, executive producer of Dawson's. Okay. So it's kind of in the same family. All right. Now, Riverdale is one of your more recent acting credits. Uh, how were you approached? to join the cast of Riverdale? Uh, they asked me. They just I just got a phone call. Did you have and to I audition? Said, no. I said, absolutely. I said, I'm there. Tell me when. Now, yeah. What were your initial thoughts on reading the script and the role you were going to play uh, besides, you know, instead of being a high school kid, being the principal this time? Did you uh, like the I was excited. Yeah, I like the character. The character was very interesting to me. Um, I've never played a principal before, so it was uh, it was kind of fun to the school. I kind of looked at the school as my as my prison, and every all the kids were my inmates. And I, what I wanted to what I wanted the audience, the viewer to to pick up on, and it really didn't. And it, it was it was in the words in episode four nineteen, which is my last episode, that he's actually a good guy, and he's there's things about him you know, the reason why he's such a hard ass, you know what I mean? Yeah. He wants to shape these kids and, and get them ready for the real world. I also think there is a piece of Holden honey that is very dark, mm -hmm. which we never we started to get to explore in a few of the episodes and we never got there. So that's, that's the part of him that I would love to, to get into and, and find out what kind of a sinister person he is. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too. Now Riverdale is known uh, for its unique one-liners. Do you guys, you or anybody else, have, uh, you know, just crack up laughing uh, during, you know, shooting because of one of, you know, those one-liners on the show? Cole and Lily and I had a scene in my office, and I was, I had this long speech to give them. They were in trouble for something, of course, and <laughs> One of the lines they gave me, I can't remember exactly, but it was something it was something about a frog. And I was trying to, it was a metaphor. I was trying to get a point across about the frog. I, I don't know, maybe you know the metaphor, but it was so funny every time I said it, which we, we just couldn't get it. I couldn't get it on film. So we just bagged, we just cut the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> it happened. I mean, there's sometimes when you just you get the giggles and it just slows everything down. And sometimes you can't, you actually can't finish the scene. <laughs> now, are you attracted, uh, to the horror genre? Um, I mean, you've done, uh, the full spectrum from shows like Dawson's Creek. You've been in horror movies, final destination, my bloody Valentine. What are your thoughts, uh, working in the horror genre? I love it. You know, I think it's fun. Uh, I, I like to, I like the stories. It's, um, it's just a ride, you know, it takes you on an emotional roller coaster that you wouldn't get in everyday life unless there's something really crazy going on in your life. So it's just a, it's an outlet for people. And, and I enjoy, you know, being a part of making those, those kinds of experiences. Yep. I, I mean, uh, that totally makes sense. Now, 
you have had uh, you've been on Dawson's Creek, for example, where it lasted years. What's it like uh, coming out of a show like that, where basically you had job security uh, for a long time, and then going in to do auditions again for more TV? It worked out for you, movies and film. But what's it like as an actor? leaving a show that is that basically gave you job security for so many years well uh, leaving a sh- when you here's the thing it's a catch-22 with a job that big uh you can you can either have job security or you can be pigeonholed right mm-hmm. so you know if, if for instance um i don't want to say anybody specific but <laughs> There are a lot of actors that were huge in like the 90s and, and the 80s, and you don't see them. They, they work the whole time, but nothing really huge, and you don't see them do another lead in a show for like 20 years. And that's because people have a really hard time of letting go of, you know, whatever it is. Uh, Dexter Morgan, mm-hmm. you know, that's what that, that show. My wife and I are, are rewatching that right now for the second time because we're getting ready to get jacked up for the, the, the sequel which um, Michael C. Hall is doing again. So, but that long, I I can't think of anything that he did in between. I'm sure he did plenty, but nothing huge. And, you know, that was a long span because everybody sees him as Dexter. So it's a catch 22. Mm -hmm. You got a little bit of job security, but I don't know how it's different for every actor. But for you, you've managed to not really pigeon your, your whole yourself into a particular type of character. Uh, Well, I had to be very, I had to be very careful too, because you know, playing Jack McPhee twenty years ago with that the content and the stories, you know, that was a that was a risky risky thing to do. So, I think I had a little bit more trouble than the other four, um, but uh, I've managed to I've managed to make it, managed to get by, and just keep working. Uh, were you really hesitant to take on that? You know what? Ha- you know the the kiss and to do that on screen were you nervous for your career i was nervous in general i wasn't really thinking about it too much i mean when you know when i joined dawson's creek the the role wasn't gay i was i was the role was created to create a triangle a love triangle between dawson joey and jack Mm -hmm. okay and then they were going to fit andy in there with with pacey which they did so it wasn't until about three or four months of playing jack straight Kevin Williamson came down to uh, uh, Wilmington and he, and he said, hey, Kerr, let's go get a cup of coffee. And I'm sitting here going, oh, oh boy. God, the talk. what's going on? And he, yeah, he basically said, I want to go down a different avenue with Jack. Now, he always had that intention, but, you know, I think they were get, getting a lot of slack from the WB because it had never been done before and they were scared. Yeah. But he obviously talked him into it and he said, look, I want you to do this. Will you? And I said, well, give me a day. And I called everybody that I respected and I asked them the question, should I, should I do this? You got you to gotta think about it. I mean, I had just landed my dream job in Hollywood that everybody was going after. And three months later, it's a different role, yeah. a much riskier role. So it was, it was a really tough decision for me, but obviously you, you know what the decision was. And I'm glad I did it because I think – we had we played a part in changing the world for the better. Absolutely, absolutely, no doubt about that. Uh, you started your career in what was it? As the world turned, soaps. Okay, now there's yep. an interesting aspect. Uh, you started in soaps, uh, then moved on from it. As the world turns was the only soap opera that you were on. Uh, you know, being a new actor, getting a role on a soap opera, it's exciting. It's work. But did you know right away that this is not where you wanted to stay long term? Yeah. I did. I knew I knew right away that's not where I wanted to be. I, I always call a soap opera boot camp for actors because you're doing 60 minutes of television per day. Uh, the writers are incredible because they have to knock out a script every day. But that being said, it's not the kind of writing where they have three months to write, you know, a script like Dawson's Creek or Riverdale yeah. or whatever. So it's very difficult to make those scripts work sometimes. And I was a brand new actor. So I was thrown into the mix. Like you wouldn't believe, I mean, I was doing, 
I, when my storyline was bigger with the well stuff on As the World Turns, when I was stuck in the well, <laughs> great story. I was doing roughly 30, 35 pages a day. Wow. You don't do that in prime time. Mm-hmm. You might do you might do nine tops, and that's if you're in everything. Typically, it's like six or seven on a, one day. So it's a, you know it's it's a lot of work. And a lot of times we would go in in the morning and we would do what you call dry block in a in a, a room. You, the actors and director would go in there and it, we would completely rewrite the scene. So the 30 pages that I had learned last night, I had to relearn in the hair and makeup chair in less than two hours before we had to do it. Wow. wow. Extremely difficult. I can imagine. So I did that, I did that for 18 months and uh, that was it for me. Now, do you regret your time uh, on As the World Turns, or do you you embrace it as a, you know, this is what got me started? No, I embrace it. It was a great start for me. I have full gratitude for for that experience. I just knew it wasn't wasn't where I wanted to be. Okay. I mean, that's totally fair. It's, it's, uh, I've spoken to a lot of people who got their start on soaps, and they've all described it the same way you have. It's very grueling work and uh personally i don't think actors on soaps get the recognition that they deserve uh because of the amount of work that they do out of out of all the many different projects that you have been on which one would you say was the most impactful on your career would you say it was dawson's the most impactful would you it, it was yeah it would be dawson's creek probably yeah now, which one? Or Final Destination, either. Which one was? Did you have the most fun shooting? Well, honestly, the one I had the most fun shooting you haven't mentioned uh, because you may not have even seen it. It was a Bruckheimer production on NBC called E Ring in two thousand five, two thousand six, right around there. Yeah, no, I have not. We seen did it. We did a. We did about a uh, maybe half or three quarters of a season, and they yanked it. That show was incredible, and uh, that was the best experience I've ever had in terms of acting. I'm not saying I mean in ter- the people were great too, but it, I learned so much on that set. Um, I was trained by these these black ops guys from the '80s that you know, they're not even black ops; they're above black ops. So it's like you don't even have a name for these guys. Um, and it was really, really cool. They taught me how to Aussie repel, which is basically walking down a wall face first. Wow. So, yeah, all, all this weapons training and, and running a range and just clearing rooms. It was just I learned a lot. It was it was pretty it was a pretty amazing experience. Now, the biggest difference that I hear in regards to TV and film is time, time that you're allowed to shoot. Everyone says you get a lot more time when you're doing movies as opposed to television shows. Uh, for you, having done both, where do you, what do you prefer, television or film? You know, I don't, pref- I love them both. I like to mix it up. Um, I love the faster pace of, of prime time, um, but I like slowing things down a bit so I can dive deeper into my character for, you know, for a film. You know, you don't always get especially in the beginning, you don't get that you learn your character, a lot of your character in, in television while you're shooting, because you don't have a ton of time. I mean, you go in on, for, on day one for the pilot and you go, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to play this guy, but it changes, mm-hmm. you know, and the writer, the writers change things too, as the character evolves and develops and you just kind of figure it out on the fly with a film. Yeah, it's one shot. I mean, that's, that's, you come in with your, what you're going to do, and that's what they get. Okay, okay. Uh, now, you were in another, <laughs> I keep going on and on, very successful WB show, Charmed. I think you were in like 10 episodes or something. What was your experience like on Charmed? Yeah, it was it was awesome. Um, I was a little nervous going in with the three girls, because you can imagine what that might be like. I did know Alyssa prior to that, mm-hmm. so that was nice. Um, but it ended up being really great, uh, great experience. The crew was a magnificent, well-oiled machine. I mean, they've been doing it for so long. Yeah. And uh, the girls were fantastic. We had a blast. The only thing I regret on that show is that they wanted me to do a full season, and I said no. I said I'm going to do a half a season. 
because I didn't want to tie myself down, and I, I regret it to this day. I should have done the whole season. Oh, wow. did not know that. Now, another yeah. thing, you did a horror anthology that called Into the Dark. Uh, that was great. Uh, <laughs> what was that experience like for you? <laughs> Pilgrim? <laughs> that, uh, that was a crazy, crazy script. I mean, if, if you watch that, you, you know it's it was just insanely strange for me um playing a head just a head for you know typically you do a prosthetic but no that was me uh -huh. i was under the table i was under the table for uh i'd say i don't know six seven eight hours getting sprayed with that you know candy blood stuff and you know it was a, i was a centerpiece right yeah. i was a centerpiece yeah. so i had kale all around my neck is I, I can't I can't even eat kale to this day, and that was a couple of years ago. It's just uh, the smell. It's just way, it was way too much. I could imagine. <laughs> oh my god, I have a, this, this image in my mind. All right, now moving on. <laughs> what intrigued you to star in the Forsaken? What attracted you to that, the Forsaken? Something about the desert I love. I've always wanted to experience the desert in in, in a film situation you know, even more of a plus. Um, Joe Cardone sold me. I, I remember having lunch with him in, in LA and uh, he just jacked me up on this movie. I'm like, all right, I want to do this. And you know, the other thing is I love vampire films. Okay. You know, so would you say that's your favorite sub genre in horror is the vampire? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, I like all, all the old Anne Rice, Anne Rice novels. Some of them they made into into movies, like Interview and mm -hmm. and, and things like that. But yeah, I love, I love that stuff. Yeah, I think AMC. I don't. I know they are. They're re, uh, they're bringing the Vampire Chronicles to life, uh, and I'm actually really oh. looking forward to that. Uh, now, where Hope Grows is a very moving film. How did you get behind that project? So uh, Chris Dowling, the director, and Chris Palaha, who was the lead in, are, are, are both friends of mine. Actually, no, that's not true. I didn't know Dowling at that time. Um, I got to know him on the film. And Chris called me up one day, and I, I think they may have lost an actor uh, for that. You know, the role is very small. I only had a couple of couple of scenes. And I, Chris just said to uh, the director, he said, look, I got a buddy who he, he might do this. I don't know. And he called me and I said, yeah, I'll come out to Kentucky for a couple of weeks and, and check it out. I'd never been to El Illinois and, and I loved the script and I love what Chris Dowling was putting together and it just was a feel good movie. I felt it had an important message and uh, I just, you know, I wanted to work with these guys again. So I did. Now that leads me to my next question. When you're, you know, trying to pick uh, your next project, what is like some of the main things you look for? Obviously a good script. Uh, but is there something particular that you're looking for in the script that you are looking for to pick a project? It's more about the character with me, actually. Even if the story's not that great, it, at least it'll give me a chance to really dive deep into a, you know another character, another experience, and and make it the best story that I possibly can. It's also important that uh, you know the people that are involved are you know sometimes you don't know them, which is also fun but sometimes you do and and it's important to me just to have a good all-around experience you know for me life is too short you know, mm -hmm. I, I just want to work with cool people that are out there to have fun and and uh, put a good uh put a good film together or a tv show and that's 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 really where i go the only thing the only thing i've you know the only thing i haven't done that i really really want to do is sci-fi that's true i mean I love sci-fi. I love watching it, and I have never done any sci-fi. Like space-type uh, sci-fi? Because, you know, Final Destination could be considered sci-fi, but is there, is there a particular type of sci-fi you want to do? Yeah, I mean, I'm talking like the Star Trek films yeah. or, you know, any, any of those kinds of se series that are out, you know, out in space on a spaceship flying around somewhere exploring. Yeah, I think it'd be really fun. It's weird. Uh, with a long resume like yours, you're right. You've never been in any kind of, uh, you know, out of this world, whether it's Mars or in space type of film. Uh, never really paid attention, but you're absolutely right. Now, um, you know, going on to 
uh, like stuff like you played everything from teenage love interest to serial killers. Uh, what kind? What roles do you like the most? And in particular, uh, when it comes to directors, have you been one of the lucky actors that you, for the majority of your, of your career, have worked with directors that have really let you uh, form the character into what you wanted it to be? Yeah. Uh, I think there were two questions there. Uh, one is I really love playing serial killers a lot. Fun. It, very fun. It sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. And two, I have been very, you're right. I have been very, very fortunate. Uh, the directors, I mean, it's always a collaborative effort, but for the most part, I'm, I'm, I'm left alone a lot, which is, you know, uh, interesting. I mean, I, I, I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to explain. Um, I'm a very heady actor. So like, I'm always in my head, I'm always working things out, but at the same time, I don't think about things too much until I'm actually on set. So I'm, uh, it's, I, I'm kind of, a, it's weird. I, I don't really get into it until I'm physically there. I work things out in my mind beforehand. I think that's once good. I get there, I think that's good. You, yeah, you don't overanalyze it before you get there. I don't want to commit to any choices because a lot of times you can do that and it's difficult to break that choice and go down a different avenue. Like if the director says, you know, it doesn't work, let's try this. If you're committed to that choice and you've been playing it and running it through your head for days before the scene, you're kind of stuck. You know what I mean? So I don't, I don't do that. I just, uh, I wait until I get there. Okay. I think things through logically, then really work it out on set. We are almost out of time. I can't believe this hour flew by so quickly, but moving forward, uh what uh what kind of roles are you looking for do you're looking for to continue doing more tv uh more film or are you open to anything and everything i'm open to anything and everything like i said uh, i would love to get some sci-fi on the resume i just think it would be a fun experience for me um doesn't have to happen but you know like i said it's it's for me it's about the character like i just want to play interesting people and, and do my best to make them even more interesting that's perfect i'm going to give you a recommendation i don't know if you've seen this movie or not uh called life it's about uh uh the basically they sent a ship to mars to pick up soil sample and deliver it back to a ship orbiting earth they come back the ship comes back with this sample it's a horror sci-fi it has a great cast an all-star cast uh if you want to check out that movie i'm giving you a recommendation simple title it's called life and of who's course, in it uh uh jake uh ja uh jack in the uh -huh. that oh god i can't remember the exact cast but it's a huge all-star cast i can't remember exactly who's in it but it's a great movie it has a great cast and it's something, you know, based on what you just told us, you would absolutely love. So check it out. And I could totally see you doing that kind. I've seen it. You've seen it? I just looked it up. Jake, Jake, Jake Gyllenhaal, Jake, Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds, Ryan yeah. Yeah. That was yep. a great movie. So that's the kind of movie uh, you would like to do. Yeah, I, I like stuff like that a lot. My, I mean, the bet, the best example I can give you is um, uh, Matt Damon in um, Martian. Well, thank you, The Martian. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I read that before I saw the the movie, and I was like, wow, I would love to do this. Yeah. And of course, you know, they go, well, Matt Damon's got to play this. Of course, he does. He was perfect for it, but. That's the kind of thing I would really, really, really enjoy. I'm, I think it's going to happen. Kerr, thank you so much. This hour has flown by. It's been absolutely fascinating talking with you. Any final thoughts you want to share before we say goodbye? I just uh, thank you very much for having me. It was a, it was a real pleasure, Viz. It was our pleasure. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Just a scheduling note, our show tomorrow is starting at 2 p.m. with our special guest, Laura Vosberg. Kurt, thank you so much. Thank you to all our viewers for tuning in. Till tomorrow, stay safe, stay walking. Good night.